Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. We haven't seen much critical reporting during this presidential campaign about drone warfare. Well, this week, investigative journalist Jeremy Scahill will talk about the secrets he's learned about our government's assassination programs. And I'll visit Ireland for the anniversary of a 100-year-old rising against empire. All that and a few words from me on men who move and states that shake. Welcome to The Laura Flanders Show, where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. If drone warfare has come up at all this election season, it's been in passing, and the candidates don't differ much on it. But how is the face of war changing, and how do our peace movements need to respond? Jeremy Scahill is an award-winning investigative journalist and a founding editor of The Intercept. He's the author of Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army, Dirty Wars, the book and the film, and now the assassination complex inside the government's secret drone warfare program written with the staff at The Intercept. Jeremy, welcome back to the program. Glad to have you. Laura, it's like being uh, being home. <laughs> it does. It feels like yeah. being home. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a bit. But let's start with the meat of the matter, the book. Um, it is based on a mountain of classified documents that you and your colleagues went through. Briefly, what is the most important thing we need to take from it? Well, the Obama administration and the president himself have claimed, um, really fr from like the first year of the administration on, that this is somehow a cleaner way of waging war, that it's a smarter way of waging war, and that it's a more effective way of killing terrorists and protecting Americans. And there, there's no doubt that under President Obama, uh, dozens of people who I think objectively could be you know, declared as terrorists um, have been killed. Whether they went through a judicial process is a whole other story. But the entire thing is predicated on a lie, uh, the lie that this is a cleaner, safer way of waging war. Uh, the reality is, and, and the, the documents that we obtained show this, uh, that at times nine out of ten of the, peop uh, of the people killed in drone strikes by the U.S., the U.S. doesn't even know their identities. Mm. Uh, in other words, nine of, of the ten people were not the intended targets of the strike. Uh, were they other so-called bad guys? Maybe. You have a chapter in the book co-authored with Glenn Greenwald called Death by Metadata. Right, and, and that's how people are, are, are essentially being killed today. It's not that you are locating an individual and killing them. They are locating people's SIM cards or their handset numbers, and there's a number of things. They call them selectors. Everything is like in corporate language. SIM card being the thing you have in your cell phone. Right, the SIM card is in your cell phone, and your SIM card has its own ID number, and your, your handset that you put it in, you know, if you have an iPhone, you stick the SIM card in the iPhone. The iPhone also has its own indicator, and then the, uh, the SIM card has a way of, of communicating with the cell phone tower, and the, uh, the phone itself has a way of communicating with a Wi-Fi communication. So your phone is basically just like a, a homing beacon that's constantly emitting signals without your knowledge. And so the U.S., the NSA, the CIA, and the military are using those signals being emitted by everyone's phones to triangulate the location of a phone that they believe to be in the possession of an individual, and that's how they trigger the drone strike. So in many cases, they don't, they're not even 100% certain that they have the person, but they know they have the phone. And so you might have given your phone to someone? Right. I mean, and, and it does happen. In fact, that the, uh, you know, the source who gave us these documents, the, the whistleblower who worked on the targeted assassination campaign uh, said that they they would watch the Taliban go into meetings and then they would they would have like a, a shuffle in a bag of SIM cards pass them out and then they would all go and spread they understood the the system um, but there also have been a, a number of cases where people have been killed because they had a phone that US intelligence believed was connected to terrorism and then a drone strike takes place and it turns out not the right person. Mm. Now the White House is releasing documents uh, purporting to tell us more about who's targeted uh, and why. Um, what do we need to think about right. when we hear the White House talk about its releases? Right. Now when someone like President Obama, who is a constitutional lawyer uh, you know, by, by trade and training, um, and has a lot has had a lot of support, uh, particularly of, uh, from liberals in this country. And I think people generally, you know, on the liberal end of the spectrum, say, "Well, we trust Obama with this stuff. We wouldn't want the Republicans to have it," which is a whole other moral discussion. Um, but we trust Obama. And so, when you, when the president of the United States looks into a camera and says uh, the number of civilians killed is minimal, uh, and and that reports that we're doing this willy nilly uh, and just blowing up villages uh, are, are false, and he says, you know, the the, the number of civilians killed is minuscule. Okay. The, the, I don't think it's that the president is knowingly sort of lying to people. It's that the system, and this is what our documents in the, in the book show, the system is created so that the number will almost always be zero when asked 
how many civilians were killed, because everyone killed in a drone strike, unless they are clearly a woman or a child, is going to be designated as an enemy killed in action. And the only way you lose that designation after death is if posthumously you are proven to have not been a terrorist. So it's sort of the reverse of, of due process. Mm -hmm. and, and so when Obama says, we, you know, the number of civilians killed is minimal, it's because the system produces uh, the number zero or very low numbers every time they do a strike, unless a journalist or a human rights organization goes to the scene mm -hmm. and figures out, wait, these people weren't terrorists. This was a wedding party. Now, you, you said, you know, some people, even on the liberal side of the spectrum, are comfortable with, well, as long as Obama is in charge. Um, but he's not the only person in charge. There's no. a whole kill chain, an extraordinary uh, part of the, your book is Cora Correa's reporting on all of that, uh, writing up the, the, the materials that you were able to receive. The other piece of it is that corporations are involved in all of this mm -hmm. too. Talk a little bit about the role that corporations play in our, in our complex, our assassination complex. Right, well, I mean, first of all, many of the slides uh, that were uh, produced that we have in the book uh, for the US military were actually done by a national security division of the IBM Corporation, uh, where they have a whole national security division. And what, what we did is we also, we, we analyzed, and they use some of the same language and actually the same templates for slides that are about killing people, hunting and killing people, uh, for other corporate clients. And they use, the, the it's, it's, it, it really, it, it seems like they are, are producing widgets. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's how they talk about it. And, 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 and the banality of evil just is kind of oozing from these things because it's like, who are, the, who are the authors who wrote these documents that refer to find, fix, finish, you know, all, all of these terms that they use, and we have a whole glossary of them in there. Um, but, I mean, corporations are making a killing off of this yeah. killing. Uh, you have Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and then you have these huge farms filled with private contractors who are on loan or being rented to the U.S. government to be drone pilots or to be intelligence analysts. And, and those individuals are essentially part of a matrix uh, that is a for-profit industry of killing. Um, and, and it's wrapped in the sort of flag of patriotism and national security. But at the end of the day, there's very little difference between uh, what is happening now with the warfare industry and drones as what happened with Lyndon Johnson when he was throwing uh, contracts to Bell mm -hmm. Helicopter because they were a Texas company and the Vietnam War seemed like a great market for them. Well, uh, the military industrial war killing complex is, as you said, nothing brand new, but this definitely is a new form. Um, we often talk on this program about the history of capitalism and how does it keep going? Well, first you exploit land, then you exploit people, and increasingly it looks like wars become like the bedrock of our um, ability for capitalism to revive itself in a moment of crisis. Totally. It's certainly what happened in the 20th century. It seems to be what people are betting on in the 21st. Well, it also is a kind of form of, I mean, if you look at what the U.S. is doing in Africa right now, yeah. it is a form of neo-colonialism. Uh, so talk about that. Well, you, you've got, the, you, you have an increasing number of what they call small footprint bases throughout Africa. Uh, and, and so the U.S., rather than deploying large numbers of troops, is starting to create outposts where they can fly uh, drones and other essentially robotic uh, you know, tools of war, uh, and then also partnering up with unsavory militias or human rights abusing governments. Uh, I recently did a, a story about how Eric Prince, my old friend, the, uh, the creator of, of Blackwater, one of his latest things was creating a privatized air force using uh, crop dusters <laughs> manufactured by a farm company in, in the U.S. state of Georgia and weaponizing them to sell to uh, the, the Christian supremacist leader of South Sudan. Um, you, you know, you have this sort of uh, growing covert or not so covert military presence in Africa. And if you just rewind history half a century, it, uh, you know, there were these liberation struggles against exploitation of natural resources, against uh, stomping out any, any attempts at uh, self-determination. And I, you know, I feel like there's nothing new in warfare except the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they, these, these companies are very much like the Dutch East India Trading Company and United Fruit. I mean, they're just a little bit more sophisticated in how they conduct their business. One of our um, subjects off on, on this book is the close relationship between the U.S. policing system and Israel's. Um, yeah. Does Israel show up a lot in, the, in these leaks? No, well, Israel doesn't show up in these documents. I mean, in, in some ways, Israel is uh, more effective at keeping secrets than uh, the U.S. intelligence community. You haven't had this scale of a leak on, on the Israeli program at all. I mean, in fact, the only real, you know, I mean, remember, and, you, and I know you've reported on this a lot, Mordechai Venunu, you know, the former Israeli uh, uh, nuclear worker, 
uh, blew the whistle in the early 1980s about Israel having nuclear weapons, which was an open secret, but he confirmed it. And then he was, as a result of that, kidnapped and then had his entire life destroyed, spent decades basically in prison or being driven to insanity. Uh, and, but, but there is a very deep Israeli connection to this, and that is that the U.S. has whole cloth adopted the Israeli assassination model. You know, in the 90s, Israel began very openly and proudly bumping off people, Palestinians, who they considered to be either uh, too popular of leaders or they accused of being heads of terror cells. And, and after 9-11, when um, you know, the Bush administration was trying to basically heap all of the blame on the Clinton era, uh, Richard Clark, who was the counterterrorism czar in the waning years of, of, of Clinton and then continued on with Bush, testified in a secret hearing in front of Congress um, that the reason that they didn't want to use a weaponized drone to kill bin Laden early on or, or, or to sort of launch a cruise missile strike that would effectively kill him is they didn't want to give the perception to the world that the U.S. was running an Israeli-style assassination program. Fast forward to you know, the, the, the middle of the Bush administration and then the Obama administration, we, we have become mm. the Israeli assassination program across the globe. So to switch to a topic that you're also deeply involved in and thinking about a lot as, as, we, as we meet, and that's the recent death of Dan Berrigan, the extraordinary poet and priest and peace activist, co-founder of the Plowshares Movement, um, died at the end of April, April 30th at the age of 94 almost 95, mm -hmm. he was part of a peace movement that knew where to go to beat the missiles and would go and beat them. That was what plowshares were, beating on the nuclear warheads or what were going to be nuclear warheads mm -hmm. with hammers, uh, casting blood. He was part of a movement that was against the Vietnam War in vast numbers. Not everybody did the brave things he did, but it was a mass movement. It was a war we could see on TV. Um, this is a continuation, as you said. The, the corporate picture of it is a continuation. But our experience, I think, as people is very different. I mean, this feels like a war that isn't even a war. We don't, it's, it's sort of atomized to the level of a drone against a SIM card right. and, and only, no coverage. And the only people that really, I think, have to pay attention on a daily basis are people whose loved ones are deployed in war zones or people who are from, uh, represent the diaspora of the Muslim, largely Muslim countries uh, where the bombs are falling. Um, but the, you know, the average American doesn't have to pay any attention to this. And in fact, you know, we, because we live in this era where we're told that you know, our ability to see into the fictitious lives of the Kardashians is, is what is reality TV, the war becomes uh, a backdrop. And it doesn't look as real in our minds or in the minds of a lot of people as their video games that yeah. they play. And it's private. It's private whether you're the war, the, the, the drone operator, operating kind of personally, privately in your private life and then going back to your family at the end of the day, or whether, as you said, you're the, the person with their being tracked and unable to communicate to others uh, what's you, happening. You, you mentioned Dan Berrigan, and, and I remember, uh, I guess it was early on after 9-11, uh, I was with Dan Berrigan and some other people from the Catholic Worker Movement, uh, and uh, and and they were protesting at the um, uh, at the, at the huge uh, battleship that is parked off of the west side of, of, of New York, the USS Intrepid. And at the time, you could sit in the cockpit of a plane, and kids were doing this, and and you could you could operate your own bombing run over Iraq, and and they had little kids going in and doing this. I mean, now that is that that is the the the, the whole gaming culture is part of this. So two things: how does our peace movement need to change? Our peace movements need to change to respond to this, to kind of republicize, to reshare this experience. Well. You know, you and I, I mean, Laura, you and I have known each other for a long time. I feel like I was a little kid when I, I first met you, and I was like, oh, my God, it's Laura Flanders. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I was living, actually, at the Catholic Worker at the time and sort of begging my way into working it with you guys. And you were, you, had, you were working a lot at Democracy Now!, one of the only people ever to be allowed to host the Democracy Now! when Amy was not around, which is kind of an awesome thing. Big, big honor. Uh, right? I don't know, but it was, uh, it, was, it was cool. And you and I had, had worked together. But I, you know, I, I learned a lot from being around both community radio and these communities of... Uh, resistance, and it really was like kind of an, an alternative um, education in in a lot of ways. And I think that um, you know what one of the lessons, though, that I think we can learn by comparing where we are now to what was happening at the height of Dan Berrigan's uh, you know global impact, which was when he and his brother Phil had burned these draft cards in Catonsville, Maryland, in in May of of 1968, and that was this intersection of 
uh, of the targeting of people of color in the United States, the uprisings that were starting uh, with, with the Freedom Rides and, and the fight for actual voting rights um, and the fight for dignity. And I think we've, we've lost our way largely on, on connecting those two. F Phil Berrigan, Stokely Carmichael called Phil Berrigan the baddest white man alive. Mm -hmm. Phil Berrigan had, you know, was, was a civil rights priest who spent a lot of time in the Deep South, um, who felt a great affinity for the black community and, and, and was, was, would always show up. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that we, if we step back and look at it, especially people that are just really focused on anti-war activism, if you don't pay attention to the fact that everything you've been opposing around the world is here now, yeah. it's, it's in the black community, it's in the targeting of young black people by law enforcement, it's in the paramilitarization of police forces in this country. And immigration. It's the immigration, it's the, it's the, the militarization of the border. All of these policies that were unleashed around the world now have come home in, in the most real way ever, where local police forces all look like SWAT teams now. There is a whole program that the Homeland Security Department runs to give uh, uh, grants to uh, local law enforcement to obtain armored vehicles that the military is done using in Afghanistan. And, and those with, now are facing down against protesters, but also just black communities or poor communities. Without a f widely distributed tax base, they're dependent on that money to operate their cities. Right. Um, What's the alternative? I know that Dan Berrigan had an alternative. When we met, you were living, as you said, at Catholic Worker. Dorothy Day, co-founder of Catholic Worker, had a vision of an alternative. Um, do you have a vision or you want to share Dan's? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm a 42-year-old I'm uh, white guy in this society. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm probably the most protected class of people um, in the world, a, a white, you know, American uh, male. And I wouldn't presume to tell anyone else how they should be organizing. Um, I have been so inspired by the militant actions of young people of color uh, in the United States. And I, you know, m my answer to your question may not be the most satisfying one to people listening, but I, it's, it's the truth. Um, I think those of us that have been around a while need to take a humility pill and listen to younger people and take their, their direction. Um, because I, I think part of the problem has been people like me telling other people mm -hmm. what, what should be done. I think we, and I include, include myself in this, need to spend a lot more time listening because y young people, I think today, especially young people in urban areas where there is a, it was warfare, uh, the state versus uh, young people, uh, people of color, immigrants, um, I think we need to spend more time listening to those people and, and you know, letting them connect some of the dots for us. And yet, to do the kind of resistance that Dan Berrigan did required a belief that things could be different. Absolutely. And I, and I believe that things can be different. But I also think that, um, you know, Dan Berrigan was asked a question by Chris Wallace, uh, who now is like Fox News Sunday, but he used to work for NBC. He was basically saying to Dan Berrigan in 1981, uh, in an interview, you used to be a somebody and people used to listen to you, and, uh, but nowadays, you know, nobody really cares. You know, meanwhile, Dan Berrigan, a year earlier, had started the plowshares movement by breaking into a nuclear plant and hammering on, on warheads. But Dan Berrigan said basically, you know, our con my conscience is not tethered to the, other, to the cord on the other end of a television set. Right. Um, Phil Berrigan was a big fan of, of, of saying that if you become obsessed with your own efficacy, then you've already lost. Yeah. That so, there are some struggles that, that, that simply to be engaged into them is, is how you define whether or not you're alive. Um, so I, I, th I think a combination of that wisdom from, you know, from the old school, which is that if, you, if everything is about efficacy, you're going to burn out and lose, combined with the direct action spirit of, uh, of so many of the Black Lives Matter activists, the Palestine Solidarity activists, you know, some combination of those two things. It's, it's similar to what I say about, about Twitter. Like, I love Twitter. I'm on it all the time, blah, 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 blah. It's short attention span theater. Um, but somewhere we have to, to take what was great about the, the way of doing journalism that you and I grew up with, where you have fact checking and editors and peer review and, and you're out there getting your fingernails dirty in the field. Talking to people. Right, talking to people and not just chatting or, you know, hip chat. None of that. You know, get out there in the field, but also communicating in a way that young people can access it. And, and it's not our job to force them to go back to the way we think things should be done. We have to also adapt to how are young people sharing information today. So, I mean, I learn a lot from, from hanging out with teenagers, you know. So. <laughs> well, I've always learned a lot from hanging out with you. Jeremy Scale, 
The book is The Assassination Complex, co-authored with the whole team at The Intercept. You can get more information at our website. You want to talk about fighting empire? The Irish rose up against empire a hundred years ago this spring. I went back to Dublin and Belfast to find out more. You're again basically right in the heart of what the battlefield would have been a hundred years ago. It was 100 years ago on Easter Monday 1916 in the centre of Dublin when a small band of revolutionaries proclaimed an independent Irish Republic. This group of poorly equipped Irish men and women took on the might of the largest empire the world had ever seen. It was an empire built on conquest, exploitation, brute force and repression. Following six days of heroic resistance, the centre of Dublin lay in ruins. The leaders met for the last time in 16 Moor Street and ordered a surrender. They were court-martialed by the British. Fourteen were executed in the Stonebreaker's Yard in Camelham Prison. Thomas Kiant was executed in Cork and Roger Casement was hanged in London. What's historically significant about 1916 is it was one of those turning points in our national history. Uh, it was genuinely the birth of modern Ireland as we understand it today. You know there's two periods of uh, the end that stood out, one was 1798, uh, which was the birth of the United Irish Movement, and uh, the second was 1916, and uh, the, 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 the Easter uh, Rising. And uh, the two people, uh, the, the likes of myself, it was unbelievable. You know, I associate the ideals of 1916 and, and what was being fought for, a break from imperialism, um, as important because it was a break from imperialism and there was a whole set of values that underpinned the idea um, of, of the kind of society that, that, that James Connolly and, and, and his comrades were fighting for. Actually, the same old problems have come back to roost. We're dealing with casual employment, insecurity of accommodation, uh, lack of accountability of uh, the media and uh, lack of people's ability to exercise control over their lives. So the parallels are actually quite striking. One man moves and a whole state shakes. When that one man is hedge fund billionaire David Tepper, that's just what happens. David Tepper is a multi-billion dollar hedge fund manager who's lived in New Jersey for 20 years. Now he's moving his home and his business to low-tax Florida, and that'll cost New Jersey millions, probably hundreds of millions, in lost tax revenue. New Jersey's not alone. According to one New York Times report, the top 1% of residents pay a third or more of total income taxes in half a dozen states. New Jersey, New York, California, Connecticut, and Maryland. Wealth has flowed so much from the bottom to the top that entire states are now dependent on a tiny, powerful class. What's a state to do? The Times reports that states are doing everything they can to get their fat cats to stay. But really, is that the only way to go? I took a look at Tepper's wealth. First, it's financial wealth. Hedge fund managers don't make things or sell things, they place bets. Tepper made a whole hunk of his wealth, some $4 billion, from a 2009 investment in distressed financial stocks, including Bank of America. Buying low, he was able to sell high when it recovered. But who helped it recover? We did, taxpayers. In 2008 and 2009, Bank of America received $45 billion from the U.S. government through the Troubled Asset Relief Program, remember TARP, and a $118 billion federal guarantee against loss. While we're talking rich, it's a bit darn rich for him to fret about paying back, isn't it? And a bit ridiculous of New Jerseyans to do anything but bid guys like that good riddance and set about distributing their assets more widely. Have we forgotten everything we ever knew about the U.S. Revolution? No aristocrats, no feudal lords welcome here. Comments? Write to me. Laura at lauraflanders.com.
and facts. If you're buried in bad news and put off by partisan puff, you have come to the right place. For smarts, not sound bites, in-depth conversations with forward-thinking people, subscribe right now to The Laura Flanders Show, where all the people who say it can't be done take a backseat to the people who are doing it. Also available as a podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever you get your podcasts. Join us. This week, I sit down with Keith Mestrich of Amalgamated Bank. What if the left had its own too-big-to-fail financial institution? We could really do something. Mm. And later, Ben and Jerry of Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. And will you vote for Hillary at the end of the day, if you have to? Uh, I'm, I'm really not sure. All that and a few words from me on the human cost of automation or my miserable travel experience. The radical potential of the word mother comes after the M. It is the space that other takes up in our mouths when we say it. We are something else. We know it from how fearfully institutions wield social norms and try to shut us down. That was Alexis Pauline Gums. This week, a special Mother's Day edition of The Laura Flanders Show, and Alexis is our guest host, taking us on a journey to explore revolutionary mothering. Mm -hmm.